Hello, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Saving Push, Five Mobile Onboarding Lessons from Smart News. Uh, my name is Justin Feynman, and I'm the team lead for the technical account management team here in, in the US. I'm joined today by my co-host, Nick Pataki, product manager of end user experiences at Lean Plum, and our guest presenter, Fabian Pierre Nicholas, head of growth and marketing US at Smart News. Thank you guys for taking the time today and being here. Thanks. Thanks, Justin, glad to be here. Cool. So before we get started with Fabian's presentation, uh, we'd like to quickly tell you a little bit about Lean Plum and Adjust. Nick? Yeah, thanks, Justin. So Lean Plum is the mobile marketing platform built for engagement. So brands rely on us to help them orchestrate multi-channel campaigns uh, from messaging to the in-app experience, all from kind of a single integrated platform. And that includes global, global brands such as Tinder, Coinbase, uh, and Zynga, who turn to us to, to accelerate growth and build long-term customer relationships. Perfect, thanks, Nick. So now if you're not familiar with us, Adjust has been around since 2012 and we were built to simplify the mobile ecosystem. So we give mobile marketers the tools they need to measure, attribute, and analyze their mobile engagements. To date, we've been ranked the number one mobile attribution SDK and we're used in the top iOS apps. Uh, we've been integrated over 22,000 times. That's 22,000 different apps we're in. Uh, we also happen to be integrated with over 1,000 partners such as Lean Plum, which is why we can make this measurement and attribution so seamless. In addition to our friends here at Smart News, uh, we also have clients such as Spotify, Tencent, Yelp, Rovio, and many, many more. Nick? Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Justin. So, okay, let's get on to the good stuff. We're going to hand over the controls to Fabian, uh, who's going to dive into how Smart News optimizes its push notification strategy through metrics analysis for improved onboarding and UX. So Fabian will discuss why machine learning can't solve everything uh, and why push priming may not necessarily be the right choice for your app. So uh, Fabian, I can hand it over to you and take it away. Great, thanks guys. And I'm sorry for all the attendees, you guys will have to deal with the French accent. So uh, hopefully I will speak not too fast and, and everybody will be able to understand. I know uh, you guys in the US have a ton of people from everywhere and I used to deal with accents. Um, so smart news, right? I think if you don't know smart news already and if you are a big fan of news, you know, feel, please feel free to install us. But essentially, we're two things. We're a technology company. Uh, the core technology, which was built by our two co-founders, is how do you apply machine learning to news discovery? So instead of having humans that curate and decide which news you get to see or not see, like some other apps, we really focus on making sure we integrate social signal and uh, trusted sources to deliver to you the digest that you need to have in a specific day. Um, and beyond that, we really focus on like surfacing trending topics like March Madness was one of the last channel that we, we actually custom built for everybody with a big uh, basketball fan. Um, the other aspect is we work with publishers, as I mentioned, and essentially we allow them to keep 100% uh, of the revenue they generate on their page um, our monetization being ad driven, but we don't take any revenue on, on this aspect. Uh, in Japan, of course, we are the number one news app and the reference. And in the US, we're growing. I think right now we're in the top 10 on Android and top 15 on iOS already in terms of reach. So beyond that, um, I, you know, before we dive in the topic of push, I always like to give a quick overview of what the growth stack is for smart news. Uh, beyond, of course, you know, adjust and in plan. So when it comes to attribution and growth, uh, growth accounting, <laughs> it's, it's more technical term. Um, we use adjust and we've been using adjust since I believe 2014. Uh, so quite, you know, um, I think now four years already. Um, and we have added uh, recently acquire.io, which mostly we use for accounting, aggregating the spend, but as well automating some of the bid. Um, so that's, you know, essentially our growth stack on the attribution side. Um, automation, so push, A-B testing, in-app messaging, we are using LinPlum, uh, primarily currently in the US, uh, and we've built uh, a few of our own tools as well, especially around uh, some of the automated um, push notification that I will discuss. Um, and, you know, great partner of LinPlum. Uh, I've used them as well in my past company at Appany. Uh, so it's my second time uh, using Winplum. And uh, finally, you know, we have one database solution that we're using, Chart.io. You guys could see our SEO stack. 
um, you know, happy to answer any question about ASO as well, <laughs> even if it's not today's topic. And finally, we have built our own ad tech for Japan. As I mentioned, we're at scale. And in the US, we're using Facebook Audience Network as well as AdMob uh, when it comes to our native ads uh, monetization. Great. So now let's dive right in. Um, I think a lot have been said about push. If you think about the space, push has been around and, and something truly unique to mobile uh, for now quite a many years. Um, each, both Android and iOS, you know, Apple and Google iterated on what push you could send, when, how push permissioning works. Um, but I think uh, coming from mobile gaming and then mobile utilities, I, I, I don't think I appreciated as much how push is really a product and core to the user experience before I joined Smart News. And so um, I wanted to really share with you guys metrics, uh, but as well the journey that we had um, from the start to where we are today and where we're thinking we want to be tomorrow when it comes to providing value to our users through push. So first step, right, is why are we here today? Why does push matter for smart news and hopefully could potentially matter for your app in terms of making a difference? So let's go right in metrics. Um, for us, right, our monetization is really through the time people spend in the app and the amount of content they consume. So the, the core metrics when it comes to usage is around daily active uh, users, right, DAU. Um, and we see a very strong correlation between essentially the opening of, of pushes in, in DAU. Uh, and overall, every time we have a push that truly performs very well because it's a big breaking news. Uh, this will be a peak DAU day. I um, think that was the case in the last uh, 72 hours. There was a lot of big news, um, especially in the US, um, and you know, with Trump lawyers being raided by the FBI and so on and so forth. Uh, and that plays a key role as well uh, when new users are coming in, if they get the push, essentially, that's meaningful to them in the first six hours of the experience, the day seven retention uh, jump up significantly. Um, so you guys could see here, right, um, if we compare push disabled user versus push enabled, the day seven retention is 33% higher. You could see it impact the time they spend, the number of sessions, and so on and so forth. So push for us is, is really important, even more so in the US versus Japan. But, you know, the quantitative impact is definitely there, and happy to come back to that. Um, when comes the time for questions. But beyond that, we have a lot of evidence, both in one-on-one -on -one interviews as well as the reviews people are posting, that it's a key value we're creating for users. So when we take a look at the reviews, you have a lot of positive reviews where just like, great app, thanks, and so on. But when you take a look at the specific topics people are bringing, Breaking news, push notification is among the top three or four features that people really praise about the app. So for us, this is a very strong signal that, you know, it's important to treat push as a product and not just uh, think of push as like a channel that you operate. Um, and therefore, you know, to iterate on your approach and, and really constantly refine it like you will do any other of your app key feature. So hopefully and i know it was only like two two three minutes but we've seen why push matters the reality is we come a pretty long way when it comes to push and we have two technical co-founders so the reality is like they started this company with the vision that machine learning will solve everything <laughs> uh, when it comes to news and when it comes to the way to engage with news on mobile and why machine learning does solve a fair amount of issues uh, that existed in, in other apps that are just relying on human creation. It doesn't fully solve everything. And so hopefully I will go through our journey when it comes to that. So as I say, right, our background is in Japan, uh, background as well as really rooted in machine learning engineering. So the one thing that was built um, before coming to the U.S. late 2014 or late 2015 was um, the fact that, you know, support for local time zones. As you know, Japan is essentially in one time zone uh, versus the U.S. So we did integrate that in 
uh, in the possibility for users to pick essentially, you know, from zero to four pushes a day that they will receive at specific times. Um, but that was it. Um, and so we, we started the journey in a pretty basic way when we came in the US. After that, essentially, um, pretty quickly, I think the, um, our content and, and BD team, um, which is headed by uh, somebody who was essentially the guy who built the Wall Street Journal.com, worked at Bloomberg for many years, Rich Jaroslavsky, and essentially he started seeing pushes that were coming, uh, generated you know, essentially just by machine learning that didn't meet the expectation of uh, a quality news experience. Um, so the, essentially he set up to build a team to um, review the regular push notification. So machine learning will suggest a list and the team will, will validate that indeed this is what needs to go out or potentially curate out uh, if something is, it could be perceived as, as offensive or just is, um, is not news or information. Um, and so that's, that's a key aspect, right? this, this curation. And the other aspect was breaking news. Um, the problem of, you know, if you just follow regular push notification is a strong expectation that our users were sharing is the fact of getting their news in a timely manner. And so as well, the team started to have an editorial process um, where it's not just one human being, but essentially a team that discuss really quickly when something breaks, uh, if it's worthy of, se of sending a breaking push to our users. And so the team to date um, is now uh, a team of, of five people. Um, and essentially that you know, covers the multiple time zones as well as the weekend and weekdays. And so, you know, as I mentioned, this, this team, um, or mindset at least is they're not here to, to curate um, in, in actively say, okay, this is what I'm gonna push, right? They're not here to build an agenda. They're here to oversee what machine learning generates. So we're not hiring necessarily editors, but people were fans of news, we interact with news content and more metrics driven. And we're in a production mindset. We're okay with the fact that's like, you're gonna have uh, uh, at night, during the day, during weekends, you know, things will come and you will need to have the capability to discuss them very quickly uh, and be able to push to our users. So right now it's two full-time headcount, one in East Coast, one is West Coast, plus one uh, permanent freelancers that's supporting the team. And you could see that they are doing, you know, the QA work, push management, and as well uh, working with our partners to make sure they have a good visibility when it comes to page views. So, as we say, right, we would definitely have still machine learning at the at the core of what our product is. And it's when it comes to real news discovery or surfacing like hidden gems that you will not find in other news app. You know, this is truly what machine learning does best. Uh, and that's, you know, integrating social signals, um, integrating as well some of the in-app reader activity. Um, and so we, we really think and believe in machine learning but, and you've seen RoboCop reference in the previous slides, supplemented with the human factors when it comes to specific aspect of the push experience. I just, you know, thought was interesting for you guys to have a quick overview of what performed best in, uh, you know, the last, I'll say, a few months. Um, you could see there's a few keywords that seems to have a, relative high click-through rate and open rate. Um, you know, sadly, of course, it's, it's as well not just the, the good news that perform best. There is a significant amount of, of uh, bad news, um, which is, you know, very similar to what you will see in, in local TV news or uh, urban newspaper. Um, but, you know, what's always surprising is I think uh, we always discovering that the audience is actually a lot more sometimes curious about um, topics that uh, might not seem like uh, mainstream than sometimes we think they are. And I think you know, the example of like the space colony uh, of animals no one knew about was, um, was a big surprise for us uh, beyond some of the other ones you're seeing in the, this slide. 
So as I say, you know, today, you, um, depending if you are iOS or Android users, you receive, you know, between one to three uh, options of pushes at specific times per day as you picked and the breaking push. But a few months ago, last October, we rolled out to all our users, um, you know, a personalized discovery experience that's called For You, which essentially um, learns from your engagement, the type of news you appreciate reading about and services more of that beyond the top news of the day. And so the future for us is to essentially blend in, still have the breaking pushes, um, still have you know those program pushes, but as well start injecting in the pushes more personalization. And I took, I think, an example that Linplum provided uh, about you know your own flight. Um, we'll uh, work currently in, in you know testing to see if um, essentially users are enjoying more having more personalized content in their push versus not. Um, but this is where we see push going. Uh, being a mix of the information you need to read, like what's breaking, um, some of the top news of the day, as well as some news that may just pertain to your own interests, whether it's um, the specific place you're in or whether it's, you know, specific topics you're interested in. And then finally, I think um, it's always great to share with you guys um, some of the learnings some of the successes, but as well, some of the failures we had uh, as, as a team. And I think when a uh, colleague of mine, Jan, myself, and some of the other two members um, deployed Limplum, we were like very excited to really uh, work on onboarding. And I think the first topic that came through was like, hey, we need to do a better job priming for push. And so I wanted to share where we are and what we, we find out. So. Everywhere, um, I'm reading a lot of the industry blog um, since you know I was more the, the publishing side on, on that many days, and push priming was really top of mind. And it seems like everybody was like, "Yeah, you need to prime for push, you, especially in iOS. You could only ask once, so make it count." So we're like, "Okay, let's set ourselves up to a push priming mission, and really um, try hard to get more for iOS users to opt in." Our Android user opt-in rate is, is outstanding. And the verdict, and, and we tried a lot more options than the one on this slide. Um, we tried many different locations to, to push Prime from you know, very early on to later on in the app experience. Uh, again, a lot of different creatives to highlight different aspects of the added value. Uh, and essentially, we failed. <laughs> we failed to really um, make a significant dent in the amount of people that were turning on push notification versus just asking them right off the bat as soon as you install the app. Um, our learning um, you know, there is we didn't have a chance to um, do more like user interview after that. Um, might be that essentially users, when they install a news app, have a, already a very spe specific idea of the value push notification will provide to them. <laughs> and essentially, you know, that the proof priming wasn't necessarily um, giving them more context um, like it should have. Uh, they already had enough context as, you know, as it was. Uh, that's our qualitative read. Again, not backed by user interview, but what's sure is we, we essentially didn't push up on metrics. So we, we were like, okay, we've run three different experiments, um, probably like 10 plus creative options. What's left to do? And so our, our CEO at the time, and I think reminded us of a great data points they had a few years ago in Japan and then kind of abandoned, uh, which was to essentially re-ask permission to uh, users. And so from push priming, we went into push redemption mode, right? Saying, well, if we only get um, a third of the users to, to opt in right on iOS, maybe we should focus on the 65% who are not opting in and try to see if we could get them to, after all, reaccept, even if it takes like going to settings and it's a pretty complex process. And so this finally was successful um, at having you know, a few more percent, it was like a three, three to four more percent of users to essentially come back and be push opt in which generated in turn like a clear business benefits for us on uh, the iOS audience. 
So our learning, at least in our segment, was that why push priming may not have worked, you know, it's okay to uh, re-ask. Uh, and we ended up with a, a creative that, again, may not have been top of mind when we were testing the different options, but pretty straightforward, um, as, as you could see on the right side. So the future for us and what we've been testing using Lean Plum in, in you know, recent days is trying to add other elements to onboarding, which right now is very minimalist, um, like showcasing different features or showcasing the different benefits and seeing if features or benefit function best, um, highlighting more some of the local content and so on and so forth. But essentially we have considered that we don't really have an issue with push opt-in on Android. And iOS, we think push redemption is, is our way to go currently. So to focus on other aspects of the onboarding experience. Um, and yeah, here you could see in this case, hopefully it comes through, but some of the key benefits of smart news, which is if you're using smart view, uh, which is our, our reader feature, you essentially get a lot less ads. You could add specific media you want. Uh, and essentially you have the possibility through swiping to really quickly like have an overview of different topics. Um, I think I've talked for, you know, uh, over almost 20 minutes. So um, I think it's, it's now time for, for questions. Thanks, Fabian. Uh, we had a quick question actually just come in uh, on one of the slides. Um, we wanted to know what the definition of FTUE. <sighs> Is that first time user engagement? What is that exactly? Yeah, correct. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks again. Um, and thanks for sharing all these insights for us. Um, you know, definitely lots of things that are actionable here to take away that um, I think any app can take advantage of, not just, uh, you know, news media. So, um, you know, let's start off the questions here. Uh, I want to, before we open up to the audience, I'm going to open this up to uh, Nick and myself. We have a few questions here to ask Fabian. Um, so, Nick, you want to start off? Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Justin. Uh, so, Fabian, you talked at the beginning of your presentation about kind of the different aspects and different components of your growth stack. Um, I was wondering if you could kind of tell us um, how you decided uh, what you were going to buy versus what you were going to build kind of in-house uh, when it came to these different components of your growth stack. Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. So we, we always go through the process that, you know, I call maybe it's old school of me, but RFP request for proposal. And we always um, essentially consider the, the build versus buy in, you know, every single time there is like a key need expressed by the business. Um, and a good example there will be like monetization in the West, right? We thought about, do we want to build uh, our monetization um, stack or do we want to leverage an external one? And I think at the time, right, the, the build was, you know, pretty significant investment in, in engineering time. And uh, our engineering in Japan thought they could make more of a dent uh, focusing on, on Japan ads and us leveraging an external stack. Um, so I think, you know, essentially we, we always start the process with the hypothesis of build versus buy. Um, when it comes, let's say, for automation, right, in-app messages, um, we had the same discussion, right? Like in, we considered like, a, I think, six external vendors before choosing Linplum. Um, and we consider as well building it, you know, in-house. And I think the, the key take there for us and the key reason in this case we choose to uh, work with, with Linplum uh, and an external vendor was really the user experience when it comes to the ease for any marketer with some training to traffic a campaign uh, was much greater using a solution like Clean Plum that will be with our in-house tools were more designed for engineers and product managers with, um, you know, were relatively data savvy, I'm going to put it this way, uh, could write their own queries and so on and so forth. So that was, you know, I think our, our consideration um, and of course, the other aspect is, you know, comparing um, on the, the cost side. And I think people often make the mistake to consider that uh, in-house is free or very cheap. Um, so I think the methodology I always recommend using, which we've used as smart news, is to include, uh, once you've got an estimate on number of engineering hours to build a V1 of the product, 
first of all, build a buffer of 50% <laughs> uh, on the top of that. And then use not um, your hourly cost that's paid to an engineer, but the fully loaded costs for the company, which include taxes, uh, which include bonuses, equity, and so on and so forth, which could be you know, far more than double the, the hourly salary that an engineer will receive. Um, and the reason why I mentioned the 50% on the top of it is mostly on the maintenance side. Even the first year, your engineers will have to iterate if you build a product in-house. And therefore, you know, this should be factored in the total cost when you're comparing head-to-head -head with external solution. So hopefully it answers your question on the build versus buy and some of the considerations. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense, thanks. Perfect. So um, question for me here. So with push notification, there's always a risk that instead of driving better retention, uh, you end up actually causing your users to churn. So uh, besides experimenting with uh, push priming, managing frequency, and content relevance, what are some other best practices that you could share to um, avoid having users churn? Well, yeah, I think um, maybe it's my marketing brain, right? But a, a key aspect is really knowing your user base and the voice they're expecting from your brand. So a good example is I know like Lin Plum is a big fan of emojis, right? And, and say, hey, you know, it really helps. And so we had the discussion internally on the, the use of emojis or not. Um, I think at the moment when we really look at our user base, it's mostly like 30 plus educated, over 80% of them have bachelor plus or, or you know, master degree or graduate degrees. Um, and, and typically, they are a big fan of reading, right? And so uh, in this case, we, we felt at least that maybe our brand voice uh, wasn't really a fit to use emojis in push notification. Um, it's the same as sometimes we curate out some pushes were just simply too, uh, to say, low bro, or like, you know, it's essentially, it's not quality information. Um, as we see it, right, our company mission is to bring quality information. So when we decide to, put, to, to have a push go through or not, uh, we really ask ourselves the question, is this quality information? Um, so the brand voice will be probably the first guidance um, because you have created an expectation right, through your app experience and, and your onboarding. I think the other aspect is really as much as possible, and you know, this is not entirely scientific, but um, try to, put, to, to make sure you have enough people internally um, who are not part of the push team or your marketing team and, and this decision making and get regular feedback on whether they're, they are seeing any perceived value or not. Same thing with family members, friends, and so on. Um, I think, you know, they will give you an unbiased perspective on whether you have added any value or not, or whether something was really problematic or not. Ideally, you want to have an external, you know, uh, consumer uh, group that you could reach out to or forum, but it's not always possible to manage that and build that. So at least have people who are not part of your team uh, provide you an honest feedback. And I think, you know, time to time, we, we do have uh, on Slack or internal discussion about whether something was truly uh, needed or was truly quality information. Um, I think that's probably my, my second advice is get, get more opinions rather than less um, on some of those decisions, especially when it's a 50-50 and there is like some, some, some question mark on whether you're providing value or not. Um, both of them are not scientific <laughs> and metrics driven. Um, so, of course, I will say, you know, always finish by taking a close look at your metrics, especially, as you mentioned, you know, people opting out of push after a specific push or people uninstalling, you know, if you're seeing big uninstall peak, Google Play is doing a good job tracking that. I believe I just is adding it, but <laughs> don't quote me on that. Um, I think it's, it's, of course, very important to go back to metrics um, on the churn and engagement and opt out. Yeah, that, that, that makes a ton of sense. I love the idea of kind of getting that anecdotal feedback from, from someone that's not uh, in the day-to-day. -day. That, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so just one more from my side. Uh, you know, we focused a lot, you know, primarily today, a lot on push notifications. So I'm curious, Fabian, what other message uh, channels you've seen success with? You know, so like email or in-app, kind of how do those 
integrate with your, you know, to what extent do those integrate uh, with your push strategies? Yeah. So email currently, uh, at the time we don't have a user profile, so I, I really can't share any insight uh, when it comes to news and email life. Um, I do believe being subscriber to a few uh, news a newsletter like Inside and so on, that there is definitely value uh, when it comes to the consumer journey through the day, right? You are sometimes, you might be at your desk and essentially you don't have, uh, your, your phone is in your pocket. And so I do believe that creating those additional engagement points would be great. But again, it's not something we offer. On the other end, we are actively using Linplum for in-app messages. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, that's the way we, we we're doing the push redemption. But beyond that, we, we have a few tests uh, currently running um, and we've seen a really good engagement when, for example, somebody is uh, in a specific locale and we're like, hey, you know, um, we think we'll, you'll love to discover the news about New York, right? Click here or San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and so far, I think the engagement seems great. Uh, if you're really like picky about, again, the type of in-app messaging you, you provide and highlight clearly the value for a user to essentially perform such an action. So that would be one. Um, and we, that's so far, I think, when it comes to experience of something that, that works, that's probably the one I could share in terms of in-app messages. We are sometimes, I'll almost say, overly cautious about preserving the user experience and not feeling like um, you know some retail apps that could be very, very aggressive <laughs> when it comes to those in-app messaging. Um, so we, you know, we tend to consider, we, People enjoy smart news because we provide a very quick experience, a very streamlined experience. So we don't want to interrupt too much their flow. Um, and therefore, that's the one success story I, I, I could think of when it comes to in-app messages. Sorry, I was on mute there for a second. <laughs> uh, thanks for that. Um, no great insights there. Um, so one more for me, and I think we'll, we'll turn it over to um, you know, so the audience's questions here. Um, but I want to ask real quick, so for users um, in Japan versus US, because you've been in both markets for a long time, um, what differences have you seen in terms of push notification acceptance between the markets? So um, right now, like if you look, uh, I'm going to first start per platform on Android versus iOS. Uh, I think, you know, Japan is, is slightly higher. Um, again, it's, it's always hard. Like the awareness of smart news in Japan is, is really high. It's almost like I believe we're above 50 percent at this point of, um, of every single Japanese person you could survey. It's going to be like, yes, I know smart news. So um, but Relatively speaking, on Android, they are slightly higher than we are. Um, on iOS, though, it's pretty comparable. Um, so, I, you know, just speaks to the power Apple has um, when it comes to controlling, you know, the the push experience. Um, and and on our end, maybe uh, that just speaks to the difference of of value. Maybe users are receiving through pushes on iOS versus Android. Um, you know, again, this is this is just some thoughts. Uh, I don't have, you know, necessarily the qualitative like consumer interview to back that up. Uh, but the metrics don't differ as much, at least on iOS uh, versus Android. Awesome. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks a lot for that, Fabian. So, um, like Justin said, we just want to open it up to the audience for a few more questions. Um, so I saw that Matthew Maine just kind of had a, a kind of a quick clarification question. Um, he just wrote, so smart news no longer asks users for push permission during, during onboarding. Uh, is that correct, Fabian? No. So uh, cur the current status on, in the US, uh, on iOS, uh, through the onboarding, will directly just you know, uh, send you the system prompt that says, you know, are you OK to receive push notification, which is, again, you could only ask once, right? Um, so that's the current status. And on Android, um, through in the onboarding flow, you have something that says, you know, opt in to our, our uh, push notification. So in, in both cases, we are asking during the onboarding. We're just not priming. So there is no screen beforehand that's going to be like, here is why push is great with smart news and why you need to say yes to the question that will be asked. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. Perfect. 
Um, we have one here from Ben. So regarding reprompting users, if they originally disable push notifications, so how long do you typically wait to reprompt? So currently we are actually like fairly quick and, and you know, we tested a, a few points, but we're currently asking um, in uh, the second session after a few essentially page views and activities from the users. So we consider that, you know, we, we went through the fact that you came back. <laughs> so you probably were satisfied enough about your first user experience in the first session. As I, you know, may have mentioned during the, the chat, we typically have about 15 uh, minutes per day per user. So five hours, you know, per month, which compared to Twitter. So people are, are really jumping in and, and, you know, enjoying the experience. So typically we think, you know, if, if you've done a few actions in the second session, you already saw quite a bit of value delivered. Um, so second session after, I believe it's after three actions inside the app. Got it. Great. And then we have uh, one question here from, from Max in the audience. And he asked, what was kind of the most important learning or insight that you, in terms of your analytic process? So what kind of metrics are you really looking at? Um, in terms of deciding which is the most important step to find out how to increase the frequency of, of use of the application. Yeah, uh, I think it's a it's a great uh, it's a great question. Well, I think you know first our analytics team is in, in the builder process, but we would just scale from one in house to to five people, uh, and and they are all joining in the coming weeks. Um, so I think you know I'll mostly speak of the experience working with product manager. Um, I think historically, we initially had like a standard in Japan uh, where we considered that um, the frequency of use within the two weeks period was key. And so we did our 80-20 and indeed, you know, um, if you're essentially over 80, uh, 11 sessions for 14 days, so 11 different days of usage out of 14, you were kind of like really generating a majority of our, our business sessions time. Um, so we, we had like you know, this FQ14 as one internal metrics um, and, and essentially trying to push a user above 11 uh, was the key. Recently, and to, to have more global perspective, uh, we kind of switched to more frequency of usage over 28 days. Of course, that creates an additional delay, right, to, to assess if the user is uh, a light, a medium, or heavy users. Um, and, you know, I think in this case, we really look back at uh, total number of session, total number of page views, total number of uh, ad view and ad clicks, which again is a core metrics for monetization. Uh, and we try to establish what the 80-20 was to segment the users between light, medium and heavy. So I guess it's going back to, you know, your core monetization metrics and seeing um, where the threshold to generate like 80% of or 75% of your revenue uh, was probably the, the one of the key step. And then of course, you know, Every time, every test we run, even if it doesn't seem to directly pertain to, to um, you increasing or decreasing the frequency of use, we're going to just monitor this metric, uh, which is a custom in-house metric as like one of the um, core metric, right, of the business. So if you're lifting other metrics, but you're degrading that, there will be a really strong question mark internally on whether we should roll out um, this test to all users. Great, thanks for that information there. So, um, a lot of valuable info. Um, got another one here from Matthew. So, in iOS, why is there no permission primer screen in onboarding? So, if user taps uh, don't allow for push during onboarding, then that user will have to get kicked back to the OS settings to turn to turn on push. So, is that not a concern? Um, you know, what are your thoughts around this? Yeah, I mean, it's it's impossible, you know, simply because of uh, the way Apple designed this, right? It's just impossible. And from my perspective, the design of the product Apple choose, which you could only ask once and one time only, is subpar from a developer. You should have the permission to re-ask if it, you know, in, in a more uh, user-friendly way after maybe a week or a month or whatever threshold Apple designed. But at this point, right, you don't have the choice. So indeed, if you say don't allow during the onboarding and you know you are reopen the app and we say hey you know are you sure we really don't want to get our, our pushes uh indeed you will have to go back to the os setting 
And so there is a drop off between people who are like, oh yeah, actually I would like to give you the push permission and the one who uh, finally end up uh, going through the OS setting, turning back on the push and coming back to the app. But, you know, again, the drop off exists, um, but there's still a percentage of users, you know, about 4% of the old, the, the new users who reaccept the push. Um, so I guess like people are getting used to navigate the OS settings. Uh, and so this is, this is a good news, <laughs> but is this the optimal user experience I wish we had? No. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. And yeah, sometimes we're just subjected to the way that uh, iOS and Apple uh, kind of says we should do things, right? So that makes sense. Um, I think we probably have time for, for one more question. In, and um, here, uh, Merhadi is asking, basically, we want to use Push as an engagement channel in our navigation app. Uh, so like a navigation maps app uh, to do things like increase DAU, increase retention, and other engagement KPIs. Um, they're asking, what do you think uh, kind of about this idea for an app like this and any advice um, or kind of use case suggestions to implement uh, kind of push notifications effectively in, in that sort of app? Uh, well, you know, I, I always, uh, as I mentioned, like I think there is really a category specific uh, thing. So uh, I, the key is really surfacing the value. Maybe the value in news is a lot more obvious than, you know, getting the push when it comes to a navigation app. Um, I will think that if you have the possibility to have your first um, journey or, or positive experience in the app, right, that the, the priming for, for push right after that or asking for push permission right after that will probably be a, a better moment um, than the onboarding. But again, A-B test it or even multivariate test it, right, so it's like uh, during, during onboarding versus post first user experience versus at second session. And assess essentially where you're getting the most bang for your back will probably be my recommendation at the end of the day. It's like um, I could see at least, yeah, three potential moments where uh, this could be a good point. Again, in our case, the drop off um, was too significant when we, we did it like later on, second or third session, to justify like moving it to, to a deeper moment. Perfect. Thanks a lot for that one. So uh, I think we are good for the webinar today. So um, just want to thank you very, very much for shedding all, shedding light on the learnings that you guys have had, um, and you know, giving us some great information on how to improve onboarding and user experience. And uh, you know, thanks, Nick, for uh, helping me co-host this today. Yeah, absolutely, a lot of fun. Thanks, Justin. Thanks a lot for having me, guys, and thanks everybody for joining. Well, thank you guys. If you guys have any questions um, after this, feel free to email us directly. Um, I do see one or two here on the list that we weren't able to cover due to the time, but we'd be happy to answer those for you offline. So thank you guys very much. Thanks, Fabian. Thanks, Justin. Thanks.